watching around the world to the Thomas and Mack Center on the campus of UNLV, Las Vegas, Nevada, for our continuing coverage of the FIBA Americas Championship 2007. This is Canada against Brazil. Canada 16th in the FIBA World Rankings and Brazil 17th in the FIBA World Rankings. And both of these teams in Group B, yes, that is the same group as the United States of America. This is the third of four games being played here on day one of the FIBA Americas Championship 2007. And for those unfamiliar with this tournament, two automatic berths to the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games will go to the gold medal and silver medal winners in this tournament. Rick Kamla and Ala Abdel Nabi on the call. And Ala, uh, we, we've seen some great action already here today. Uh, Uruguay beating Panama in overtime. You've got Puerto Rico uh, shocking, uh, uh, Mexico shocking Puerto Rico 189, and we expect more fireworks here today. This should be a good one. Absolutely. We've got Canada with a lot of guys that have played in America. We've heard of them, but it's really all about Brazil. Leandro Barbosa, that kind of team has a strong backcourt. Let's see what they do tonight. And the starting lineup is brought to you by State Farm, and Barbosa is in the starting lineup for Brazil, obviously. Thiago Splitter just taken late in the first round by the San Antonio Spurs. Murillo Becker is up front as well, and in the backcourt, Machado and Silva for Brazil. And for the Canadian national team, well, no longer is Steve Nash the leader. He is retired from international play, at least for the Canadian national team. May come back if they make it to the Olympics, uh, but maybe not. Obviously, Steve on the wrong side of 30, and it's up to the young guys to carry on the tradition. And you've got Jermaine Anderson. He is now the point guard for this team. Carl English, a lot of D-League experience at the two. The three is Olu Famatimi. Jesse Young is the four. And the five is Samuel D'Alembert. And what a story he is, you know, born in Haiti, moved to Montreal at 14, uh, and just got his Canadian citizenship at the 11th hour <laughs> on August 7th. And much to the delight of that great man, Leo Routens, head coach of the Canadian national team. Absolutely. And if you remember that name, Leo Routens, obviously from Syracuse fame, who was a great player at Syracuse, played overseas for a number of years, now finds himself coaching the Canadian national team. And he's got his son on that team as well. But when you talk about Canada, they really do miss a guy like Steve Nash, as any team would. Canada's full with a lot of athletic guys who could finish. But the problem is, you've got to have that conveyor of the ball, the one who gets him the basketball. Let's see if a guy like Jermaine Anderson can fill the big shoes left by Steve Nash. And we talked about Canada being without Steve Nash. Well, Brazil will be without Anderson Verajao. Uh, because of the contract status with the Cleveland Cavaliers. He's a restricted free agent. The Cavaliers have made the qualifying offer to him, but no pen to paper yet on the side of Berejao. He wants more money, obviously, than that qualifying offer, uh, but he will not be here with the Brazilian national team. That is the bottom line. And the thing is, again, he's in a situation where right now his future is still up in the air. He wants to make sure that he doesn't go into a contract negotiating situation injured. And let's face it, sometimes things can happen out on a basketball for court. When you play as hard as Verejan does, you just don't want to end up with an injury, something that will have repercussions for years to come. Right now, he's got to make sure that he takes care of business and signs that deal first. But he'll be ready for Brazil when they need him next year. And what about Nene? There he is right there, the big fella. You know, not in the starting lineup. He'll obviously be, uh, you know, when you think about this program without Verajao, it's Barbosa and it's Nene. Uh, and, and I love, I mean, you can see Nene growing out the fro. He's looking good. He's got <laughs> the body's trimmed down a little bit. You know, a couple of years ago, the weight was up a little bit. Uh, ended the season fantastically with the Denver Nuggets, and uh, he should be really a horse for this Brazilian team. Well, first of all, Co Coach Carl is not there to make him cut his hair. That's the first thing. <laughs> but what I loved about his progress last year was here's a guy, Nene, that lost about 40 pounds, Rick, during a regular season. By the end of the year, as you mentioned, playing his best basketball. Coach Carl talked about him being put on the other team's best offensive player and letting a guy like Marcus can be roam free. That says a lot about the progress where he used to be and where he is now. This guy is a presence. Let's see what he does out of the basketball court here because they need a lot more out of him than the Nuggets do during the regular NBA season. Let's see if he's up to the task. And you've got a couple of eight-figure bigs 
in terms of salaries <laughs> in the NBA on this court. Not right now. Nene's on the bench. He's an eight-figure guy with the Denver Nuggets. And Samuel Dallenbear is an eight-figure guy with the Philadelphia 76ers. We are ready to go. Canada against Brazil. The first game of the FIBA Americas Championship for both of these teams. Rick Kamla, Ala Abdel Nabi on the call, and we are ready to go. Splitter and Dallenbear will jump center. Splitter, a guy that we're used to seeing in the Euro League, playing for Tau Ceramica in years past. A lengthy fellow, loves to run the floor, runs the floor for a guy his size probably better than anybody else in this tournament, and a great finisher as well. Lacking a little physical presence, if you will, to his game. But again, here's a guy, Tiago Splitter, when you talk about, he's only 22 years old, Rick. A long way to go and a lot of improvement. Long way to go for that three for Leandro Barbosa off the mark. And Machata with the rebound. Barbosa, the sixth man of the year last year in the NBA, came off the bench averaging 18 points a night. That is one heck of an accomplishment when you talk about coming off the bench and still getting your points. A lot of athletes on this Canadian national team. They can leap out of the building. They can run and gun. A very exciting team. And obviously Brazil loaded with talent. This should be a good one. And down low, that is Jesse Young drawing the foul. The starting power forward on this Canadian national team. And in speaking with Michael Malone, uh, one of the assistants for Leo Routens here with the Canadian national team, Jesse Young's a guy that doesn't get talked about a lot, but they love his grit and the fact that he's a dirty work guy that doesn't need touches. He just goes out there, brings his hard hat, and does his work. 25 years old, Rick, a guy who played very well in the last Pan Am Games, 2007, averaged about seven points and about three and a half rebounds. So here's a guy who can do it for you on the offensive end, but is a presence as well, a space eater, if you will. And when you add him to a couple other guys on that team, like Samuel Dallenbear, that is a pretty sure front line. It, I, 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 you know, I have not spoken with the, the, the head coach of of Brazil. Uh, Lula is his nickname, but you know, I, I, I'm wondering why Nene doesn't start. But obviously, he will see a lot of minutes. You would figure that a player of his profile would be in the starting lineup. That was Carl English with the miss. The great Red Auerbach used to refer to John Havlicek in that same way. He said, you know, I love to have a strong guy coming off to play against the opposing team's second team. So maybe Coach Lulu is saving Nene to play against second teams, get himself going, get the confidence there, and then I bet you, Rick, we'll see him when it comes come crunch time. Well, there's no doubt about it. He's the best reserve in this tournament. Jermaine Anderson, the hit ahead to Famu Timi. Back-to-back -back seasons in the D-League with the Arkansas Rim Rockers, and he can rock the rim. Brazil in a passive man-to-man. -man. Satisfied with letting you get the pass away from the basket on the perimeter. As soon as you enter the lane, the pressure gets applied. And D'Alembert, I, I was told about his practice habits when I, in speaking with Coach Malone. And he said that, you know, he... he some guys may come in and, and have the star aura about them. You know, we talked about the eight-figure salary and, uh, uh, you know, a tremendous shot blocker and a real solid NBA player. He does whatever is asked of him, no complaints, and, and he'll give you even more than that in practice. And they're the shot block on Tiago Splitter. He's got great timing there. One 6'11 guy going up against another. You see him get the best of that exchange right there. Remember Tommy Amaker coached him at Seton Hall, my former teammate at Duke. When he was a freshman there, I got a chance to work out with a guy with Samuel Dallenbear. Real raw back then. You can see his athletic ability, but now his game has become more refined. He's been able to pick his spots when he's aggressive and yet still let the game come to him at times, really starting to use the head on his shoulders. He's a much better ball player. You see him right there getting the rebound in traffic. Brazil ice cold early on. D'Alembert played his first competitive basketball as a sophomore in high school in Montreal. This guy has not been balling for very long. No, again, Montreal isn't known for its basketball <laughs> hot spot, but he was late to the game, but his athletic ability is something you can't teach. We talked a little bit earlier about him being raw. Well, now all of a sudden he's got a lot more arsenal than he had before, especially on the offensive end of the floor. Tough layup right there over an outstretched D'Alembert. Murillo with that bucket. 24-year-old center, six foot ten, ties the game at two. It's a Brazilian tradition for all their athletes, and it started with soccer players to be named or have one name as a nickname. A lot of them, even Leandro Barbosa, is referred to in Brazil as Leandrinho, 
which is shows you that hey, the nickname it's a fad that has caught on in all sports, not just soccer. I mean, you've got Marcelino, Nizanio, Murillo, <laughs> Marcelino. It's fantastic. I love these and names. The suff- these Brazilian and players. The suffix I N H O means little. So you're little Leandro. You're little. Um, Anderson or whatever whatever the name may be when they add that I-N-H-O like Ronaldinho in soccer It just means little Ronaldinho sort of like Thomas and Tommy in our American culture But Nene is just Nene. There's well, no little. There's used, no Inyo with Nene. <laughs> well Nene translated means baby So I don't it know does, if you want to get right. that sm- much smaller or younger than that And how ironic is that nickname is <laughs> Machada misses that shot Brazil uh, didn't get the start time of this game, apparently. They are foggy here in the first quarter. But still down just two. Here's Famatimi. Tough Spin shot. move, fade away, no dice. And Dalembert over the top there, just being aggressive. Not a bad foul early, but if, again, you got to keep an eye on your fouls. You pick your spots. Coaches love to see the aggressiveness. But remember, in international play, you only get five fouls. And unlike the NBA, where you're allowed an extra foul. Quiet crowd, quiet game to start here. Both teams right now on the defensive end, very, very satisfied with just sitting back and letting the offense run its course. Barbosa, his first bucket of the game, ties it at four. And you think about his play at the 2006 World Championship last year in Japan. Not good. 13.2 points per game, just 2.8 assists, and is the leader of this Brazilian national team. They need a lot more than that from Barbosa. Absolutely. In the 2005 edition of this, Barbosa was on top of his game, averaged over 21 points, five rebounds, four assists, and two steals. Wow. So we know he's capable of doing it on this stage, whether or not he can do it tonight. Canada may have something to say about that. And that was Carl English fading and going glass. That was a sweet bucket by the kid born in St. John's, Newfoundland. He's 26 years old. He gives Canada a 6-4 lead. Not a lot of movement on either side of the ball right now, on defense or on offense. Teams are still feeling themselves out, feeling each other out right now at the beginning of this basketball contest. Barbosa lost it on the drive, but a foul call. He's going to be aggressive like that all night. That's just who he is. Look at that. Oh, Dalibera raised it. Great he got rotation. by his guy, but Dalibert was there. Second block of the game already. That's what Samuel does. That's why they want him there. Again, the anchor of their defense. Great block. Good rebound by Jesse Young and a foul called on Tiago Splitter. Lula Ferrara. <laughs> Not pleased. <laughs> Looks like somebody just took his lunch away from him. <laughs> Lula, it's early, baby. <laughs> Look up. Samuel Dalibert, two blocks, one foul. Canada on top. Samuel D'Alembert with Steve Nash retired from the Canadian national team. He is now the leader of this program and comes off a nice season with the Philadelphia 76ers. He was drafted 26th overall back in 2001 by the Sixers and just two years at Seton Hall. I mean, this guy is on the fast track, didn't, as we just said. Uh, didn't start playing competitive ball until his sophomore year of high school. Two years in college, first round draft pick, now an eight figure guy, two blocks a game. It's really amazing how far he's come it in really, such a short amount of time. You're absolutely right, Rick. And the thing I love about him is wherever he's been, he's gotten an opportunity to, to play and has made the most of it by improving and learning every step of the way. That's a lot of credit to the man as an individual and the fact that he's got passion for the game that he loves. Barbosa ahead of the pack answers that bucket by Carl English, 8 6 Canada. We'll see a lot of that. Leandro being the first guy down the floor. Barbosa jets on the end of his feet. What does Nash call him? A one-man fast break? <laughs> he doesn't even need moves. I love that. Just try to beat him to the basket. Doesn't even need any triple threat moves whatsoever facing the basket. Just get it and go, Leandro. All of these teams played, as you know, uh, in the Marchand Cup at San Juan, Puerto Rico, not too long ago in sort of a tune-up for this tournament, and uh, so they're very familiar with one another as Barbosa scores again, tying it at eight. And they went into that championship game, Brazil having to beat Canada by 11 points with the way the point system worked out, that that was what was needed for them as far as a margin of victory. Well, they beat them by 13 to wind up winning the Marchand Cup, so pretty impressive to know you have to get something done by a certain amount of points, 
and going out there and achieving it. Very impressive performance by them. Dalbert turns it over, indecisive with that offensive move. And some good news uh, that I can report to you and everybody else from Las Vegas. Carlos Delfino injured his knee uh, that he had surgery on a couple of years ago at the Marchand Cup. And there was some trepidation whether or not he would play. Now, Argentina does not play on Wednesday, day one of the tournament. They're going to play on Thursday. Uh, and their first matchup is going to be against Uruguay as Brazil hits from downtown. A long three right there, 11-8 Brazil. Uh, but I talked to Carlos out there in Vegas. He said, it's no big deal. Uh, I'm going to play in that first game. And that's just fantastic news for both the Raptors and the Argentine national team. Absolutely, too. And here's a guy we talk about sometimes when you're playing for your national team, bad things can happen. Injuries do occur. It's just part of the game. You'd like to see a guy like Delfino, who's going to a new opportunity and a new environment in Toronto. You want to see him start with his best foot forward. It's good news that his knee's coming along nice. And you just saw Leo Routens, head coach of the Canadian national team, on the bench. And, you know, you think back to last summer uh, when Tony Parker uh, broke his finger in the jersey of Leandro Barbosa in, I believe, the last friendly before the World Championship. So, you know, you're playing the game. Injuries can happen. And thank goodness Tony Parker, who injured his ankle a little while ago, is going to be okay for the Eurobasket tournament coming up in early September. I mean, can you imagine if he missed back-to-back international events because of injuries and friendlies? Yeah, it's, got, it's a tough break at times, but again, it's something that's just part of the game. Great finish right there. Brazil on the fast break, filling the lanes. JP Batista down the lane, the 25-year-old center, six foot ten, looking deft here with the finger. I didn't know JP Batista could finger roll. I'll tell you what, the book on him, and he's a strong bruiser type, but had a little bit of finesse right there. A lot of touch on that finish. Not so much on the free throw. Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the no look underneath, and Batista will head back to the free throw line. Machada with a sweet find to Batista, who will have a chance to make amends from the strike. The persistency pays off there, the hustle by the collective team, and that's D'Alembert, I believe the foul is on, if I'm not mistaken, it is. Yeah. And that is his Ooh. second foul early. Something to keep an eye on. Two fouls, two blocks, but the most important category at this point for Canada is the two fouls. Samuel D'Alembert, the Haitian sensation, as he's been called, is uh, going to have to take a seat. That's a big loss for Canada so early in the game. No doubt about it. But you're always told as a basketball player when there's a shot blocker under the basket as the last line of defense, you attack shot blockers. What they want you to do is be passive, to be timid. But when you go at them and you force the issue, chances are good things are going to happen. Referees reward aggressiveness. We saw a perfect example of it right there. Taking it to the big fella. Brazil after the slow start. On top, 15 to 8, and almost another turnover right there, overplaying Valtinho Silva. And already they've made an adjustment that was not the passive defense we saw at the top of the, this, this match. Now, all of a sudden, Brazil's paying, playing passing lanes, getting their hands out there. Hey, there are coaches out there who chart deflections. Right now, Brazil's got a few on their side. Jermaine Anderson had two and a half seconds on the shot clock and just hoisted that one up. Barbosa. Oh, and it's tapped in right there by Tiago Splitter, and the lead has swelled to 17-8 Brazil. Interesting story about Tiago Splitter. When he plays for Tau Ceramica, he wears the number 21. Well, now he's been drafted by the Spurs, but there's a certain 21 already there. They asked him whether or not he thought Tim Duncan would give up his number. He <laughs> chuckled at Tad. That number is going to go down in the Hall of Fame, San Antonio 21, TD, Tim Duncan. That number's going to the Raptors with George Gervin and uh, I believe Johnny Moore. That's is, right. Maybe Artis Gilmore. Is Artis he one the of eight the train is one of them as well. You're absolutely right. An AT&T Center down in San Antonio. Special K has to be up there, doesn't he, Keenan? I would think so. Larry Keenan, That's I don't right. know who would... he is. I'm just stabbing at that, but... That's, you're making me think now. I we'll have to put our best people on it and find out. There, there are people scurrying, <laughs> Google searching as we speak. <laughs> JP Batista back at the free throw line. And if you're wondering, where do I know that name, JP Batista? Well, his last two college seasons were with Gonzaga, and he was WCC All Tournament team both of those years, and obviously uh, went to the tournament, the NCAA tourney in both of those years, and uh, Gonzaga made runs both times. Second leading scorer on that Gonzaga team behind a guy a lot of our viewers may have heard of, one Adam Morrison, who plays for the Charlotte Bobcats right now. So he's got a lot 
of experience playing American basketball, NCAA tournament, and at the highest levels. Let's face it, I believe you and I, we got a chance to see last year Duke play against Gonzaga. Gonzaga is one of these elite programs right now. You come out of there, you're battle tested. No doubt about it. I believe your Dukies won that game at the guard. Thanks for Gonzaga, bringing that up. They? I brought it up for a reason. Thanks for finishing it for me there. We, we are one heck of a team. <laughs> are you sure about that? How far did Duke go in the tournament last oh, year? Oh, you have to bring that up now. <laughs> I, have to go. I still haven't been able to go to Buffalo. That's the site of where we lost. Here's English trying to make something happen. And the offensive rebound is put back up and in. And that was Vlad Kuljanin. And that's what he does. He's a big body, throws it around, very aggressive. He knows his role isn't a guy who's going to get the ball and have to be a go-to player. He plays off of other guys and, again, sees his opportunities by cleaning the boards. Jermaine Anderson. Out to English. Closed well. English still with it. Nice little handoff. And Kuljanin traveled with the basketball. Canada gives it up down 11. Just seems like Canada is out of sync right now. Not very aggressive. They're looking for someone else to take charge. And right now, that someone else in the past used to be Steve Nash. You can tell that there's something missing, and a lot of it has to do with they're missing the best conveyor of the basketball that there probably is in the world right now. Here is Barbosa, teammates with Steve Nash, with the Phoenix Suns, and the weak side rebound to Carl English. Canada looking to get themselves going here. Brazil having an easy way of it up until now. Tough shot. Denim Brown with a force, but the UConn grab knocked it down. And he was drafted in the second round by Seattle in the 2006 draft. And they caught him almost immediately. Two preseason games with Seattle, and that was it. And this is a dude, Denim Brown, 19 per in the D-League with Tulsa last and year. two years ago in this same tournament, he had 28 points against the USA team. Denim Brown, people remember him, he was a graduate of the University of Connecticut, beat my Blue Devils in the Final Four. He was like their Vinnie Johnson. Yes, he was. Instant heat, microwave, as soon as he came off the bench. And uh, sad to say that in that game against the Dukies, he had a fantastic game, and he's one of the reasons why that the Huskies wound up winning that national championship. He's a heck of a ball player. He's not one of the guys that they would talk about at the top of the broadcast, but but at the end of the game and throughout the game making big plays, and Denim Brown actually left the D-League in March to go play in Turkey, and one more tidbit on him, this blew me away, and uh, uh, much credit to Dave Katz, our fantastic stat guy for feeding us all this stuff. Had 111 points in a game as a high school senior. You're you know a baller. I don't care who you're playing against. If you get 111, you're a player. You know what that tells me, though, right? That he doesn't pass. He's got to learn to pass. <laughs> <laughs> After 100, he should have called it quits, Rick. That's just greedy. You, you match Will, and then you got to stop shooting, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> stop being greedy. 100 and plus. Why? Closing oh. seconds of the first quarter at Tiago Splitter ends it with a flourish and a major jam. 25-12 Brazil over Canada. So Brazil, foggy, sleepy, completely out of it early in the first, and now they're up 13 at the end of the quarter. And you see Splitter here. We talk about his days at Tau Ceramica. That is the strength of his game. Changing ends better than probably any big you'll see in this tournament. Again, great find right there. They do like to get up and down the floor. Some of it has to start from their defense, but let's look to see their aggressiveness on both ends of the floor. Right now, it's going for them. And Canada's got to get it going. they got to get their act together. they got to get Samuel Dalber back on the court. Leandrino Barbosa, 24-year-old, born in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he is the leader of the Brazilian national team, literally and figuratively. Absolutely. And you look at the difference that we saw the stat sheet a little bit earlier up on our screen. Seven assists for Brazil, zero for Canada. Canada just right now in the offensive end, very, very stagnant, out of sync. A lot of that has to do with the way Brazil's playing them. Up in their face right now, not giving them any room for movement. Levon Kendall out of pit missed that shot and Canada still down 13. Brazil back the other way, knocked away and Canada will come back. Splitter. David Thomas. Splitter saw his open teammate there, just unable to get it to him. Oh, what a long shot by Juan Mendez. 
And that was a three for Mendez, and he brings his team within 10. So wholesale changes. We have a lot of substitutions. We talked about Levon Kendall and Juan Mendez. Andy Routon, son of head coach Leo Routon, is also into the game, and Canada trying to run. Ball comes up. Oh, I thought that was going to be a dunk. David Thomas couldn't gather himself, but he does get the layup, and Canada starts the second quarter the right way. Us guy, old guys, we just like to say he was conserving his energy there. <laughs> He's got a lot of basketball left to play. He's 30. It's still two points. Barbosa for three points. Someone's going to have to get on him because right now you think? <laughs> he's been able to get <laughs> to the basket and knock down the threes. He's going to be almost impossible to guard if someone doesn't step up right now and offer up some kind of obstacle. David Thomas with maybe not the best shot selection of his career. And there's a good look at Andy Routens currently balling for the Cutes. Looks a lot like his dad. Interesting thing about what Brazil is doing on offensive end as we watch Leandro here drain the long distance three. On the other end of the floor, Brazil is keeping Canada to one shot and done. One and done as we like to call it. Getting offensive rebounds is just not part of Canada's game right now. You gotta give credit to Brazil, they're doing a great job on the defensive end of the floor. You know what though, on the, the previous three by Barbosa, routes went under the screen. Well, that's because of his speed. He's afraid of, as he turns the corner, he doesn't want to chase Leandro, and he's never going to be able to catch him if you give him a half an inch. So what he did was go under, but he can't stop somebody who has it going on all cylinders. So that just speaks to how unstoppable Barbosa can be when he's on his game. Absolutely. You just got to pick your poison, right? Absolutely. Do you play off of him? Uh-oh. Oh, we don't. That's the coach's son right there. He, he said he heard it pop. That's not a good sign. Oh, Andy Routens is, is down and writhing in pain. This does not look good. You hate to see this. You see him planting his left foot right there. And knees just not supposed to bend that way. Unfortunate for him and his team. I overheard him say he heard it pop, and that can only mean one thing. A ligament and you just hate to see something like that we don't want to speculate out there we don't know for sure but it doesn't look good Andy Routens in much pain is he is helped to the locker room by he's, members of the staff of this Canadian team and he's not putting any weight on it that does not look good and our, our heart goes out to Andy and, and obviously uh, you know he's going to have an MRI all we can do right now is cross our fingers and hope that uh, it comes back negative yeah and here's a guy who in the 2007 Pan Am Games six weeks ago had a, a average 13.4 points per game, three assists and 1.2 steals. So they're gonna miss a lot by his absence. Let's see what, what they can do as far as having other teammates step up and fill the void. And he led his team in all three of those categories. And you know, the big picture is his career with Syracuse. And he has two years left uh, with the Orange Men. And there is his father, Leo, who obviously is going to be coaching with uh, a heavy heart and a preoccupied brain for the rest of this one. You know, right now his, his attention has got to be divided a little bit. I mean, no, bottom line, that's your son in the locker room right there. And you can talk all you want about the task at hand. And I'm sure he's focused at that on that because of his other players out there that he feels responsible for. But when your blood's in there, and suffering with a little bit of pain, you gotta imagine that Leo's also thinking about that as well. So look to see how he handles the rest of this game as well. He's gotta be thinking about his son a little bit. And who can blame him? 12 minutes into the game, Nene right there with a steal attempt and he's called for the foul. And He's wearing the chagrin, and so am I, frankly, because I wanted to see the big fella go Shaquille O'Neal style, coast to coast for the jam. Do you think he would have dunked it? I think he would have dunked it. <laughs> I, I, David Thomas took the easy way out. I think Nene would have flushed it down. What I'm impressed with is look at his foot movement right there. He bailed him out by reaching, but his foot improved. His foot movement has improved so much from even earlier on when he started up in October for the Denver Nuggets, that loss of weight has really helped his game tremendously. Barbosa, almost an and one, draws the foul, and I can safely say I have never been in that position in my entire life. Uh, and you know what, when you think about Nene in the Denver Nuggets, Kenyon Martin, you know, brought over, I think on a max contract, yep. at the very least, mega money. 13 million a year. And 
he's coming back, obviously, from his second microfracture surgery. Let's just say that Kenyon Martin's ready to go, which he says he's going to be for training camp. Even if that's the case, I think Nene keeps that starting job that he held down last year, and he was just fantastic, uh, you know, March, April, and in the playoffs for the Nuggets. And, and they, if you remember, Rick, they went 10-1 and one in April, the Denver Nuggets did, and a lot of it had to do with his improvement out on the floor. Again, you would think with losing Kenyon Martin that there would have been a big gap there, but Nene stepped up more than admirably and played fantastic basketball. And I think a lot of that, his play, has to do with the fact that the Nuggets may also entertain the fact that they want to get rid of Marcus Camby because this guy is a guy for the future. I, I say this with all due respect, Alex. I love you. I don't Jeff, agree with I, it. I, 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 I heard the report <laughs> that, you know, people were, you know, coming after Camby and that I, I never heard that Denver was shopping Camby, but they're not trading Marcus Camby. He has a re, he has a reasonable contract. He's still, you know, what is he, 31-32, still has a lot of tread on the tire. And he's the defensive player of the year. There's no pogo stick in the NBA like Marcus Camby. They are not trading Camby. It never made sense to me at the beginning when I first heard those rumors. I thought they had to be crazy. But, again, you know how these things get started. The rumor mill is always spinning. I just can't imagine Marcus Camby having another address, especially when you consider not only is he loved on the court, but that Denver community has taken him with open arms. He has become such a philanthropist in Denver off the court. I, he's endeared himself to the community. I can't imagine Denver without Marcus Camby. Let's put it this way. The reports on Camby possibly potentially being traded did not originate out of Denver. No, no. We can safely say that because I know the <laughs> Lakers wanted him and they offered, you know, Kwame and some stuff for Camby and I'm sure Denver laughed. Anything short of Kobe, and obviously they're not trading Kobe for Camby. There's nobody on the Laker roster you could give Denver for Camby, and it would be a fair trade. I would agree with you. I'm not thinking. I'm thinking that George Carl wasn't on the end of those pitches. <laughs> he was not trying to get rid of his best defensive player and the best defender in the league. How do you do? And he's seven foot tall. I don't understand how you can do that. The fact that it was even out there. If I was Marcus Camby, it would bother me a little bit just to know that I'm on the trading block. But again. Those are just rumors, and I don't think there's any substance to it whatsoever. I agree. 30-19, Brazil over Canada. Just over six minutes to go in the first half. Canada struggling to find points, and Levon Kendall gives them a J. 6'9", 23-year-old, born in Vancouver, British Columbia, played his college ball at Pitt, big bucket. Absolutely, and they needed it. It's been a long, dry spell for them, and the thing about it is they haven't gotten easy baskets, Canada. Everything that they've gotten, Brazil has made them earn. That can simply not go on if Canada has a chance of winning this game. You've got to get some easy buckets in transition. And Canada helping out Brazil with that foul. They finally got a miss from Barbosa, but then fouled him. Again, fouling on a three-point shot. And that was after the attempt, too, Ala. It's enough to contest the shot. Coach K, my old college coach, told us these were the numbers. 48% average shooting when a shot's uncontested. When you put a hand up, Rick, it drops to 38%. Now, that's not blocking it. That's just simply putting a hand up. Guys should be satisfied if they're in good position to just put a hand up on a three-point shooter. How often do you see a three-point shot get blocked? Very rarely. So what you do is play the percentages, get a hand up, and hope for the best. A guy like Leandro Barbosa, with his lack of height going up against a big, that should be a tough shot with a guy contesting it a hand in his face. And he had two guys on him, and, and he missed the shot, and Mendez with the late close committed the foul, and you know, thus far, one out of two for Barbosa, and he is working on an awesome first half here, uh, on his way to a 20-point first half. Those kind of fouls give coaches gray hairs. Rick. And there is Leo, and not too many gray hairs up there. Not sure if he colors it or, or what the deal is, but Leo is a young-looking dude at his age, and not sure what that age is, but Leo's a nice, nice guy. Obviously, analyst uh, for the Raptors, yes. works with Chuck, Chuck Swirsky up there on their broadcast, doing a great job, and head coach of the Canadian national team, and that pass off the hands of J.P. Batista, out of bounds, and Canada will get it back down E11. Just didn't look like he was ready for that pass. The golden rule, if you're a big, as a guard penetrates, you gotta have your hands up at all time. If you don't, guards are just gonna stop passing you the ball. Alex Garcia into the game for Leandrino Barbosa. Garcia has NBA experience, 2003 to 2005, with the Spurs and the Hornets. 
Not much experience, but can say he played NBA basketball. Great rebound right there. Splitter using all of his length right there and gets the ball out quick. What I love about Brazil is see how they pass the ball up the floor. The passing is a la, reminds me reminiscent of the old Boston Celtics. The ball can make it up the floor a lot quicker than men running. Machado missed that three for Brazil. Back the other way, Canada misses their three attempt. And the foul is called on Canada. Nene drew that foul on David Thomas. Canada showing some life at least. A little fire in their belly, if you will. Right now, up until it seems like they've been able to just take whatever comes to them and they have not been the aggressor all night. Let's see if that changes. But as Bill Walton, our good friend, would say and remind, <laughs> do not mistake activity for achievement. <laughs> Brazil by 11, we step aside. Welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada, the host city of the FIBA Americas Tournament 2007. Glad to have you with us. Rick Kamla, Ala Abdel Nabi on the call. Brazil by 11, and there's a look at Nene. Nene, a guy who, again, we talk about how important he's been to the Denver Nuggets. Here's a guy that right now has an opportunity to really take over the game on the inside using his width. Rick, I got to bring the step back a little bit here. You did quote Bill Walton right there. I'd love to tell you the origin of that quote because I don't want to give Bill Walton too much credit. <laughs> the bottom line is that was from the great Wizard of Westwood, okay. John Wooden, and he's got a whole bunch of them. For instance, be quick but not in a hurry. So let's not give the big redhead all the credit in the world, even though no one loves Bill Walton more than I. So, so Bill Walton and Juan Mendez a la a football player flipping over and <laughs> slamming down to the hardwood. But I saw this dude face to face in Vegas. He is built to last, Juan Mendez. I wonder if they gave him the first down on that play. He's a powerful guy, there's no doubt about it. Tumbling over Tiago Splitter right there, but Canada gets it back. And as brutally as they have played here in the first half, they're not dead, they're just down 11. They have to be a little bit aggressive here. And what's shocking me about them, look to see how much motion they have on the offensive end. Look at their guys right now. Standing still, really not involved, not a lot of passing, not a lot of cutting. Guys just filling five different spots out there. That's just simply not gonna cut it, even though they get a great move there over a Nene defending. That was a great basket right there. Great post move with a little baby hook from the baseline. And Juan Mendez, who fouled Barbosa on that three attempt in you know, a very mysterious defensive play. Uh, really nice hook shot right there. Took the contact, and he has a chance to make amends with a three-point play of his own. And that's a great one dribble drop step. Takes a middle, then he sends him back baseline with a nice soft touch. That is a big-time pro move right there. And help me out here. There had to be a fall away from the ball. Splitter is at the line. No free throw. Forthcoming for Juan Mendez. I believe it was a foul on the rebound right there. Splitter got himself underneath in good position, and someone went over the back. But he's giving back these points here. Misses two easy ones. So let's see if Canada can capitalize on this break. Just keep your eye on their offense. Very, very stagnant offense. I know they're trying to space the floor, but there's absolutely no movement whatsoever. Alex Garcia fouled Carl English on his drive, and Lula Ferreira says that was Tiki Tack, if ever I've seen. Now, who is that? Who do we attribute Tiki Tack to? Is that Vital? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a Dicky. That's a Dicky V. Uh, Ism, if you will. <laughs> what, what you're doing to it in Canada right now, by being stagnant on the offensive end of the floor, you're not pushing Brazil at all. You're allowing them to rest on the defensive end of the floor. No movement, no cutters. We all know as a, as a ball player out on the basketball floor, if you're on defense, the easy guy to cover is the guy that doesn't move. The guy that never stops moving, that's the tough assignment. Right now, if you're Canada, you've got to pick up the pace on the offensive end. Make Brazil work. Canada chipping away at this lead for Brazil. It was in double figures moments ago. It's now down to eight. Now it's on Canada to get a stop. And look at the size mismatch. Nene against Mendez. Somehow they threaded it down low to Thiago Splitter, who lays it up and in. It's back to 10 for Brazil. Don't know if that was by design, but it still worked out. And what they were allowing Nene to post up, but they had a lot of guys that were going to sink in and trap him. So yes, he may, may have a size advantage, but he's going to be outnumbered whenever he gets the ball in the post. Canada's going to see to it. 
Mendez had a low touch there, but he was defended well, and Brazil back with it. And it looks like uh, Samuel D'Alembert, uh, it's the John Chaney rule. You get two fouls in, in a five-foul uh, limit type of game and not playing the rest of the first half. And that is a sweet knockaway by Jermaine Anderson. Back comes Canada. Active hands right there, pays off. And you got to remember something. As far as Samuel D'Alembert, we talked about how new he is to this team. You see the jump shot there from the foul line. Here's a guy that really hasn't gotten the confidence of his coach yet. Coach Routens doesn't know whether or not he's capable of playing with two fouls. So to be on the safe side, you sit him down. But as he learns more about this man as a player and his temperament out there on the floor, he may put him in later on in those situations. But right now, just not quite sure what he's going to get out of it. That's a great point because Routens is a new coach uh, of this program. And Dallin a brand new player of this program. And Mendez completes. And that's what Canada is missing. Again, we can talk about the absence of Steve Nash. And they don't get a lot of easy breaks. But you saw their defense lend itself turn into a, all of a sudden an easy basket on the other end of the floor. They got to get a lot more of that if they want to stay in this game. Hey, credit Canada for hanging around. They're only down six despite playing badly. And we're back in Las Vegas, Nevada. It is the 2007 FIBA Americas Championship. Two Olympic berths are on the line here. If you win gold and silver in this tournament, you're going to Beijing. And if you finish third, fourth, and fifth in this tournament, you are still alive. This pre-qualifying tournament about six weeks before the Olympics next summer. And if you do well in that tournament, then you can get the last couple of bids to the Olympics. So still opportunities to make the Beijing Games. As we speak, Spain is in, courtesy of winning the World Championship last fall. And China, being the host country, they are in as well. Everybody else vying for those spots. Those two precious spots we talk about at the end of this tournament, everybody really would love to put themselves in that sweet position to not have to worry about doing more work prior to the Olympics. You want to make sure you're well rested, you want to practice, and you want to be a smooth oiled machine, but you don't want to expend any emotional energy that it would take if you had to qualify six weeks prior to the Beijing Games. Mendez underneath, and he has been fantastic off the bench. The sweet feed from David Thomas, it's a four point game, and Thomas has a ring. It's not an NBA championship ring, but he won a ring uh, when Michigan State, the Spartans, won the championship with Mateen Cleaves and Mo Pete back in 2000. He was on that team. Yes, played for the great coach Tom Izzo. I'm a big fan of his. You can tell just by playing for Coach Izzo, he was taught the game the proper way, and he plays the game with a heady confidence, and you got to like that about a guy who, again, has flown under a lot of people's radar, but he knows what he's doing out there on the floor. Very, very talented. Well, that's a nice save right there by Jermaine Anderson. Still time on the clock. Five with which to work for Jermaine Anderson. Nice job splitting the defense. Poor looking shot right there. And over the back on the rebound attempt. And David Thomas throws it up in frustration over his back. But you have to credit Leo Routens, Michael Malone, the staff there on, on the bench for Canada keeping this team in it. And, you know, not rolling the dice desper desperado style getting D'Alembert back in the game they're still very much alive and D'Alembert should be ready to go shot out of a cannon in fact in the second half you would hope so and the thing about it is what I like about Canada is they have not panicked they've realized that this game is a long way to go possession by possession you don't have to come out and do this spectacular thing keep it simple limit your mistakes and that's what they've done I, I've also seen them notice that on the defensive end they're much further out on the floor forcing the Brazil's offense to be 25 30 feet away from the basket and you've seen Brazil have to work for everything they've gotten with about five minutes 56 seconds left to go in the second period here. You're seeing a different Can Canadian team now. Nene got about seven minutes of run, and he will sit down. Brazil, on the strength of those free throws by Nene, they're up 36-30. Looking for a post up here, nothing. They're gonna go to pick and roll. Mendez. Oh, has he been awesome off the bench for Canada in this first half. That a three, and it's a three-point game. And that may be just the thing to get him going. Versatile player. Look for the post up first. Nothing there. Pops out to the three, Rick. That is a rarity. Oh, Levon Kendall almost threw it away. It is taken back in Canada. Chance to tie with a long uh. one. And a bad pass by Jermaine Anderson. Picked off by Silva. Back he comes for Brazil. Kind of telegraphed that one. Silva saw it coming all the way. And Barbosa says, this is my time, guys. I want to get 20 before the half. He has over half the Brazilian points. Down to three seconds left, and 
Is that a kickball or a foul on Levon Kendall? I think they called the foul there, but you don't want to. I think Leandro made a bad decision right there. The referees looked like they rewarded that. Never try to dribble through a double team, which is exactly what Barbosa tried to do. Yeah, they did get a kickball right there. So two seconds left for Brazil right here before the half. A low scoring first half, and that is good news for Canada because, you know, Brazil has a lot of firepower. And I want to ask you this. Has, has this, defensively, has this been a case of Canada taking it away from Brazil, or has Brazil rested on their laurels a little bit because things were coming very easily for them when they had that 12 13 point lead and it seems it seems to me like brazil really has just been foggy and distant here late in the second quarter well i think they've switched places i think it was canada that was a little lethargic at the beginning of the game brazil the aggressor now maybe it's just human nature you find yourself successful doing very well you tend to relax a little bit Canada behind the eight ball from the beginning of the game they have more of a sense of urgency no surprise now that it's only a three-point game let's see who can maintain their aggressiveness and that high level of intensity because it seems like both teams right now are finding it very fluctuating if you will very hard to maintain over a whole duration of a game and right now it seems like Canada is getting the better of Brazil right there that was an obvious kick and for the viewers watching around America and around the world, uh, let's hope they land on the same page, both of these teams <laughs> in the second half, and, you know, just wage a battle here in Vegas. Brazil currently up three. They got one more chance with two seconds left, and Barbosa wounded slightly on that foray to the hoop. It's going to take a lot more to keep a good man like him down. He's used to the bumps and bruises of 82 games. This is going to be, I, I would imagine, the ball going right into his hands. No surprise there. Here he is from deep. Oh, we couldn't get that shot to go, but Barbosa, a big, big first half, and his Brazilian national team on top, 36-33. He has been the story for Brazil in the high teens in points, and Samuel Dalibert in his two fouls has been the story for the Canadian team. Absolutely. We thought he was going to start off great, had two quick shots, but then being so aggressive, he got himself into foul trouble. Let's see what he can do in the second half. Well, we're going to get a good look at Samuel Dalibert at half number two. Let's hope he stays out of foul trouble. Halftime festivities on the other side. We are ready for the second half. Brazil 36, Canada 33. And the bad news for the Canadian national team, hey, Dalibert with two fouls. The really bad news for the Canadian national team, this injury mm. right here to Andy Routens, son of head coach Leo Routens. And it is the left knee. Uh, the word from Las Vegas is that he will not return to this basketball game. Uh, we do not have anything more beyond that. Is a knee in it is a knee injury, and he will not return. And we don't want to speculate as well because we really don't know all the facts, but what we do know is he's not going to be able to come back in the game, as you said. Huge loss for Coach Routens, and it's also got to be deflating as well because not only is he one of the guys that leads you on the court, but he's one of the most well-liked guys out there as well. Really does make everybody else around him better. Let's see if Canada can bounce back from this huge loss. Rick Campbell, Abdel Nabi on the call. Happy to have you with us. And the second half is off and running with a missed perimeter shot by Alex Garcia. Now that's a great way to start this second half. You hold him to one shot, you come down, you hopefully are methodical in your offense and get the best shot possible to no avail. Was that the best shot possible? I don't believe it was. Again, you don't need threes at this point in the game. If it's a wide open three that's given to you, so be it. But if you can get something inside, why not start off there with the higher percentage shot? So important is the first couple minutes of each period. And you want to make sure that you put your best foot forward. Not quite sure that long distance three from the corner was the right way to go about it. And it was a quick shot too. It, was, it didn't look like a rhythm shot. He nope. wasn't necessarily wide open, but Carl English is a nice player, and he is a scorer for this team. Here is D'Alembert. Well, we call that a heat check. So he was trying to see whether or not he was hot. Jury's in. He's not. But a heat check out of the locker room? <laughs> hey, that was a nice pass right there. Almost an and one for Jesse Young, but he will go to the free throw line for a pair and a chance to make this a one-point game. The foul on that man, Tiago Splitter. Again, he's got a size advantage over Splitter, smart enough to use it. Sees a great cut right there off of the double team. 
runs into a guy that really has no answers for him. Let's see if he can convert these two free throws short on the first. Jesse Young, born in Peterborough, Ontario. Four years at George Mason. Pretty good numbers there in his career. Nine points, six rebounds, and spent the last three seasons in Spain with DKB Joventu. And played very well in the Pan Am games. Averaged seven points, three and a half rebounds in the 2007 Pan Am game. So here's a guy we know what he's capable of. He just has to give it to you night in and night out. And you're, let's face it, you're going up against a very athletic Brazilian team. Athleticism sometimes may get the best of you. Let's see what happens with the outcome tonight. Barbosa picks up where he left off in the first half with a bucket and a four-point lead for Brazil. Is it me or he just makes it look so easy? The good ones do or the great ones do. I can't call Barbosa great yet. He may become that, but he is at least good and making it look very, very easy. The feathery touch. When are you going to call him great? I'm waiting. <laughs> he's not great yet. No, he's not great, and I agree Steve with you. Steve Nash is great. Barbosa is not great. It's about your body of work, and his body of work is still a, pro a, 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 a progress. Uh, he's still progressing, I should say, in that manner. Right now, he's not where I think he's even capable of being, but wow, is he pretty talented with all the skills you'd ever want in a basketball player. If he were on a bad team and he got shots whenever he wanted, he's a 25-point-per-game guy, right? Yes, and I think his percentage, his field goal percentage would go down because he wouldn't have a guy like Steve Nash as well. Let's face it, Steve Nash, I'd like to call him Gerbers because he spoon-feeds you like a baby. <laughs> Here is J.P. Batista. Oh, the nice shot over Dalibert and... Was Dalibert unaggressive right there because of the foul? I think he was to a certain extent. Again, you want to be out there on the floor, but what good are you if you're out there playing no defense? Now, I don't think he'll do a lot of that throughout the course of the second half, but maybe a little gun shy here at the beginning of the second half. Didn't want to pick up his third this early in the third, but it's an eight-point deficit for Canada right now. That finger roll wouldn't go. Dalibert was there for the board, and I think he drew the foul, and he did. Alex Garcia holding up his hand. And that's what I'd like to see from Dallin Bear. If you're going to be a little hesitant on the defensive end, nah, he looked like he contested. It was a good move by J.B. Batista there. Young fella out of Gonzaga. Nice move, good drop step. And he had to shoot it a little bit higher over the outstretched arms of Dallin Bear. Great finish right there. But Dallin Bear can be very effective on the other end of the floor. Sort of like a lot of young guys, how they feel your way through. They want shots. Well, if you have the right mentality, a big like him can go get it off the glass. And you get a lot of offensive rebounds, and it lends itself to getting fouls on the defenders as well. So you can really benefit your team by not even having any plays called for it. Jesse Young called on the foul. It was a moving screen. They're very lax in how they call moving screens in FIBA competition, but you don't like the NBA, the is it? No, it's not like the NBA with the foul calls or the moving screens. A lot of differences, a lot of subtle differences, and Jesse Young, another foul there over the back, or actually, I take that back, that violation goes against Brazil. Canada gets it back. Now, I thought Young was the one who did the reaching, but apparently the referees, that's a good call right there on the moving screen. But I thought it was Young who did the reaching on the other end, and apparently it was the Brazilian player, Nene. So back to Canada, the ball goes. Well, help me out with this. So, Young scoops it up and misses badly right there. Was it that Young was too physical on that moving screen right there? In other words, if you don't kind of knock your guy and be ultra-physical with your guy, you can move and be late on that moving screen and not get the call? The rule is when you're setting a screen on someone with their back to you, the defender has his back to you, you have to give him one step because you don't want to clobber the guy, take his head off. You have to give him one step to be able to evade the screen. If you press up on him such as he did on that play, giving him no option to go anywhere, that's an easy call by the official. Canada down eight. Six and a half to go in the third quarter, and they are ice cold here in the third. Going about it the wrong way. Too many outside shots, right? Exactly. Again, these are lower percentage shots. You're already down. You're not doing yourself any favor by playing into Brazil's hands right now. They want you to shoot long-distance shots. Garcia to Splitter, and Splitter was fouled from behind from the elbow. And let's so, see if that was a shooting foul, Ala. I looked like it was on the pass, but he saw Batiste underneath the basket wide open there. J.B. Batiste had an opportunity, but the foul came prior to the pass. Let's see what the refs called. Jesse Young, a magnet for flesh here in the third. I, I think that's three fouls in three minutes. I'm not sure, but... A lot of whistles going against him, and maybe good news for Canada. Juan Mendez back in the game. He was there. Uh, he really spearheaded their attack and their run in the second quarter, and 
Barbosa, a rare miss. Well, he certainly does not waste any of his fouls, Jesse Young. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to let you know that he was there. Barbosa, nice move on mm. Dalibert. Couldn't get the roll, knocked out of bounds by a splitter, and it will go over to Canada. And they are, Canada's teetering here, it feels. I mean, you know, another 5 7 a run by Brazil, and Canada's in a tough spot. But here down eight, if they can go on a 3-0 run, a 5-0 run, now we got a game again. So they, I think they, stuff really hanging in the balance right now for Canada. And their destiny's in their own hands right now. I think they have to be the ones that really kind of seize the moment. Right until, up until now, that's a great shot right there. Maybe that'll help them along the way. But they've been, it seems to me, very satisfied with what comes to them as opposed to going out there and dictating the tempo. Maybe we'll see a little different Canadian approach in the second half. Splitter and Thomas fight for the board out of bounds off of Splitter, who looks beefed up, doesn't he? He does look a little bit buff. Um, we've seen him over the years play for Tau Ceramica. Was always known as the lean player, the one who wasn't overly aggressive, wasn't overly physical. Looks like he's added a few pounds. Now, that thing may be just sitting on the beach at Copacabana <laughs> down in Brazil where he's a little doughy, but I think he's hit the weight room. I think he has as well. Here's Mendez slithering through and scoring. And the foul. Juan Mendez continuing to make plays here. Canada's right back in this thing. Just what the doctor ordered, being aggressive. That is going to help, not just on this play, but it's going to help throughout the course of the rest of the game. Canada has to remain aggressive. Leandro Barbosa and Brazil, they come into this tournament 17th in the FIBA World Rankings. Canada, their opponent here today, 16th in the FIBA World Rankings. And both of these teams are in Group B. They are also in that group with the United States of America, Venezuela, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And as we resume action, Juan Mendez at the free throw line, trying to complete a three-point play. And I've got a very cool stat on Mendez. The all-time leading scorer in NCAA history for Canadian players at 22-10. And he played at Niagara, second all-time in that school's history behind Calvin Murphy. I'm going to give you the old Johnny Carson line. I did not know that. You did not know that? Well, I knew about the Calvin Murphy thing, and that's pretty impressive. When you talk about the second in scoring at a small school in Niagara, but given the fact that Calvin Murphy, Hall of Famer, great player in the NBA for years, pretty impressive. For him. He's in rarefied air. Yes, he is in the elite at Niagara University. It's impressive, right? No Canadian scored impressive. more points in Division I than Juan Mendez, who has been fine for Canada in this game. Nene looked to draw a foul right there on Dalibert. No call and a long bucket for Brazil. is sent in by Leandro Barbosa, and the lead back to seven. A little bit more information on Mendez. He is from the Dominican Republic. His parents are of Dominican Republic uh, origin, if you will. And he's got 11 brothers and sisters. Wow. So pretty tough at the dinner table. That's why he's scrappy, or else he wouldn't eat. He's a tenacious dude. Missed the three right there. Barbosa goes high off glass, and then they bounding off of bodies. And it comes to Denham Brown. Back he comes. Down seven is Canada. Dalber wants it. He's got the smaller Garcia on his back. Come on, Sam, take him. Goes to the hook shot and misses. Now, when you see, we'd like to call it as a big thing. I got a mouse on me right now. <laughs> you cannot take a left-handed fadeaway jump hook when you have a diminutive one. He's going to hear about Covering. that, isn't he? He's going to hear about it from me, let alone his coach. <laughs> All bigs around the world are offended right now. And it, it really put his team in a bad spot because now they're down nine. Well, now they're down seven. Nice jump shot by Denna Brown. The guy we talked about, the product out of UConn, the Husky, 6'7", able to knock down the three there. Tough shot. And Mendez took one for the team. J.B. Batista knocked him over. Canada gets it back down seven. That's always been his M.O., a wide body. Doesn't mind throwing the beef around a little bit. Maybe a little bit too much thrown around. A little too aggressive right there. Referees catch him with the foul. Barbosa was made with 190 last year in the NBA, and he shot 43% from three-point range. However, the three-point line's a heck of a lot closer here in international play. That's got to feel like a layup to him. Absolutely. And when you think about the fact that not only is he 
the center of attention on this team. He's going to get a lot of touches. Let's face it, you play much more relaxed and comfortable when you're the main man. Wouldn't surprise me to see him really flex his muscle out here in this tournament because he's the main guy and everything revolves around Leandro Barbosa. Well, he needs to, frankly, coming off a, a very subpar world championship last fall. And Ooh, the oh, foul right man. there on Juan Mendez. And a pretty good decision, right, to take D'Alembert off of Nene and, and put Mendez. I mean, you're giving up a little bit in size, obviously, but you can't get that third foul on D'Alembert. Absolutely. And you can always send another defender and double team as well, too. So what you want to do is you're protecting your best big, and you can also play defense by committee there. So you're really not losing much. Brazil moving the ball around. Toe shot from the corner. Alex Garcia nailing it. The lead is back to 10 for Brazil. Now, people in Brazil, when the scouting report is out on Garcia, they like to refer to him as an earlier version because he's older than Leandro Barbosa, but bigger and stronger. So he's a big, strong guard. Pretty heady words right there. One heck of a compliment. Dena Brown drives, cannot score. Nene knocked it away. Oh, knocked away from behind. Olu Famatini thought he had a layup. Brazil says, no, no. Here's Barbosa for three. Well, that's a big miss from the Canadian perspective, but they get the rebound. Can they control? Yes, they can. Canada can simply not allow Brazil to get second and third chance opportunities. It makes you play defense for longer periods of time. It's just going to make you tired. Levon Kendall right there getting used and abused by Nene, but Kendall draws the foul. Are we going to give out Oscars? Because I believe that there was an Oscar in store for their supporting role, of course. Well, I mean, I I'm, I'm hearing you on the Oscar, but watch this. Yeah, you're right. I thought there was a little more upper body well, contact. That's exactly my point right there, Rick. If you lead with the lower part of your body, no foul, that's how you establish and hold position. If there's a shoulder or an arm thrown into it, then I'm all for that. That's an advantage gained by an illegal move, but Nene using that posterior in a proper fashion. And Olu Famatimi got hacked in the act, and he will go to the free throw line. Kind of surprised from Famatimi. I expected a lot more of him coming into this game, into this tournament. I know he's one of these guys that has a lot of ability. They depend on him to really bring it. A guy who was played for the Arkansas Rim Rockers, played for Coach Nolan Richardson at the University of Arkansas, two years there. Here's an interesting fact about him. He had tied Kobe's all-time record of scoring at the ABCD All-Star Game. Kobe's record was 40. Famatumi had 40 as well. But he fell on hard times when he had a knee injury, his ACL. He's never been the same player. But wow, how much potential and ability does this young fella have? Nene with the up fake, and he was fouled hard, and he does not want Mendez coming over to say, my bad, and are you okay? Nene fired up. And wants none of the sportsmanship offered up by Juan Mendez. He's probably telling them, I've already twisted my braids. There's no need to twist them anymore. He took a major shot to the skull right there. And Mendez saying, hey, man, I'm just playing help D. Watch this. Watch his head snap. Ooh. Twice. You don't have to like the foul, but that was clean basketball right there. You pump fake and someone goes up in the air, you got to expect the contact. Uh, Mendez will not back down. I mean, there was no confrontation there, but Mendez is a tough dude. And obviously, Nene is just looking at the bot. And, uh, you know, Nene is kind of like, you know, you can say my bad, but don't be touching my hair. <laughs> I've worked hard to get I my do looking like this. I'm not my sure. teammate. Don't touch me on the head. It's more like a don't, not a do. <laughs> <laughs> Getting bad hair advice in Brazil. Oh, this is the, the free throw there. Well, if you're wondering about the name, May Beener Rodney Hilario was the name before he changed it in the summer of 03. And yes, he had it legally changed. It is Nene. Like we said, it means baby, he is anything but. Barbosa. Great pass. Oh, that's a nice finish right there. Barbosa set it up baseline style. Head up on the penetration. You got to love, he sees the defense converge. That we talked about it earlier, how Canada was stagnant. Brazil right there with a great cut to the basket. Easy finish right there. Leandro Barbosa did all the work. 
Murillo with the payoff. Under 10 on the shot clock. There's Levon Kennel. He can hit that shot in his sleep, and he does. Elbow extended. That is true in an eight-point deficit now for Canada. Again, he saw an opening at the elbow there, flashed to it. His teammates did him a good did a good job of getting him the basketball. And you mentioned, Rick, that's his game. That little mid-range jump shot. Under 20 seconds to go here in the third. Canada needs a stop. Brazil wants to get it back to double digits. Here is Silva. Off to Murillo. Dene underneath, working against Mendez. That would have been an and one. You heard the slap on the arm. Nene brutalized here late in the third. The foul on Levon Kendall, and Nene back to the free throw line. He's really having his way with the Canadian players right now. I mean, he's gotten to the point where he's loose and lathered, and he's starting to throw his body around. And quite honestly, there really isn't anybody. I'm not quite sure there's a lot of people in the world that can contain him when he gets going like that, but I certainly don't see any resistance offered up by the Canadian front line. And a good stroke by Nene. Big, strong, and with a soft touch. What more can you ask for from this young fella? And what I enjoy about him is he's got a passion for the game and he wants to get better. He has steadily improved his game every year that he's been in the NBA. You talk to Coach George Carl, he does nothing but rave about the guy. And why wouldn't you? Nene is turning into a heck of an NBA basketball player, and he has been big, literally and figuratively, for the Brazilian national team in this basketball game, led by Splitter, that man, Barbosa, and Nene. Brazil, after three quarters, has a 54-44 lead. They led by three at the half. They're a plus seven in the third. We've got the fourth quarter coming up. Can Canada get back in it? Stay tuned and find out. Well, well, Leo Routens and the Canadian national team have uh, won the battle with the referees a little bit here. After the foul shot by Nene, there was one second left, but they, they started the clock too soon. There was three seconds left when he towed the line, so they're redoing it basically here. Three seconds left for Canada. One last shot. It's Jermaine Anderson from just inside half court. And now we are officially <laughs> through three quarters in Vegas. And we're going to keep it right here through the break so through three it is brazil on top 54 to 44 so a little clock malfunction right there uh i guess you know things happen no harm you know no foul in that in that situation and you know brazil obviously thinking that way right now had jermaine anderson hit that shot and canada goes into the huddle uh, with a lot of momentum you know different story but it remains a 10-point lead for the brazilian national team and you can see in the third really it's been the first and the third solid for brazil uh the second was solid for canada so based on that pattern you would think the candidate would play better than Brazil the fourth, but you know. Well, they have nobody in foul trouble, so let's see what happens. Can Canada come back, resurrect the good play that they had in the second period? That's up. It, it's going to be something that we're going to have to keep our eye on. But right now, it seems like the way things are going, as far as Brazil's concerned, they're aggressive on both ends of the floor. They're getting the kind of shots that they drew up on their offensive scheme when the coach would tell them, we need to get the ball into our strengths. Our strengths are guys like, obviously, Barbosa, Thiago, Splitter, and the name has really awoke in the third period and become a presence inside. Not that kind of presence. But he does have presence. <laughs> he does have presence. But he does have presence. I don't know his name, but that dude has presence. Now, the three-point shooting, we've seen a lot of yuck yes, in this game. Two of 14 from Canada, five of 17 from Brazil, and I, I, think, I think we saw Garcia hit a three, but it seems, like, it seems like Barbosa has just about every three for Brazil in this game. It, 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 it is been all about Brazil's and, and Barbosa from the perimeter. He's obviously one of the guys that can knock them down. Let's not forget Andy Routens going out early. For Canada, he would have been that guy who drills the, the consistent threes. But here's a guy, if you look at Samuel D'Alembert, he doesn't have to worry about fouls right now. If he doesn't come out and play all out, I bet you Coach Routens is not going to be pleased, maybe light a fire under Samuel to bring it in the fourth quarter because it's do or die right now. And they're still in this basketball game. But you got to make sure that you keep Brazil, limit them to just one shot down the floor. If you let them have second and third opportunities, you find yourself in the hole. And Brazil right now can really milk the clock every time down the floor.
As you and most of our viewers know, you trigger runs to get back into games on the defensive end, and that is the strength of D'Alembert's game. So he needs to wreak all kinds of havoc on the offensive end for Brazil, turning away shots, getting rebounds, getting the one and done, as you said it. Here is English. Nice feed into D'Alembert. He scores. It wasn't a clean dunk, but it is now an eight-point game. Right on cue as well. He must have heard us talking about him. But again, you have to get him involved. And you'd be surprised when a guy scores on the offensive end, his D picks up as well. Barbosa with the air ball, very rare indeed, and back up English for Canada. You like the start right now if you're Coach Robbins. You've gotten it, your big guy involved. Trapping into corners here. Mendez for three, yes, it is good. A 5-0 run for Canada to start the fourth. We got a five-point game. Great find right there. They tried to trap the Canadian player in the corner, was able to get rid of the basketball. Fine, Mendez. Juan is stroking it right now. Juan last year played in Israel for a team called Naharia. And what was Thiago Splitter thinking? I mean, he's not Tony Parker. That was Thiago Splitter trying a teardrop runner wrong-footed in the lane. Gio, that is not your game. Coaches would tell you you're allowed one crazy shot per tournament. Look at this, Carl English again with the setup to D'Alembert. This time it was a clean flush, and it's a 7-0 run for Canada. And it's no surprise, certainly doesn't surprise me, that they've gone inside out first. We talked a little bit earlier about Canada being down in the third quarter, coming right out of the locker room, shooting quick threes. Those are low percentage shots. They've changed their approach, they've gotten it inside to the big men, and they've been rewarded thus far in the fourth period. Back comes Brazil off that miss. It is Barbosa. On the wing, here is Silva. It is good. Big bucket for Brazil. It's back to five. Changing ends quicker than the Canadians are. Canada has to get back and identify players. It's one thing to just get back in the run in the lanes, but Brazil's running to corners. You have to identify where people are, especially in transition. Carl English really playing a point guard role, but now hoist the long three and he hits it. We got a three-point game. Two-point game, excuse me. Confidence, you can see it growing in the Canadians right now. Everybody is a much different person, and as a collective unit, as a team, you're obviously much better when you play with some confidence. And Brazil is settling for the long shots here in the fourth, and Canada closing well, rebounding well. Mendez, oh, and it's followed home by Samuel D'Alembert. We're tied at 56 with 7-12 to go. Just like that, in a blink of an eye, Canada is back. 10-point deficit to start the fourth. They're back in a tie game. Where have you been, big fella? All night long, we've been looking for that. He started off the game strong. He seems like he wants to end the game off strong as well. He is climbing the boards, both ends of the floor as well. Well, the first two here at Vegas have been good. Looks like game three is going to be good. Stick around. Samuel D'Alembert shackled in foul trouble the first three quarters. Not the fourth. He's been an entirely different player. Ferocious, in fact, Allah. Very aggressive on both ends of the floor. His presence has definitely been felt. You see him right here climbing the boards. That is all about timing. And the big fellow, when it comes to his game, has impeccable timing. His strengths are shot blocking and rebounding. And that's all about timing. And for a guy who really hasn't played the game a long time, you can tell those are just instinctive things that are already inside of him, makes him the player that he is. They're going to need a lot more of that. Now that the game is tied, every possession counts. How about that? Big to big. The nade to splitter for the jam in Brazil back up too. Now that's... D'Alembert's position right there on the back of that 2-3 zone. He cannot allow anybody to sink in behind him. Got caught napping there a little bit. Looking to feature D'Alembert now. He's got Splitter on him. D'Alembert drives. He was knocked off his spot by a Splitter. No call. Mendez had it knocked away by Nene and a steal. It's a three-on-one. Splitter gets it back and scores. What an offensive foul. They wave it off. The difference between... Basketball that we're accustomed to, NBA basketball and FIBA basketball is at times they do not have the same kind of approach or the same outlook on the charge. He was clearly deep under the basket right there. Maybe that wouldn't have been a call in the NBA, but FIBA rules going the other way. 
But, you know, I understand the restricted area, but if you just take that out of the equation, he was in position, and that he was, was charge. in position. I just, in my opinion, a little too deep. But he was planted for sure, and that's why I think referee... Oh! He's feeling it now. Oh! Are you kidding me? I didn't even know he had that in I his didn't game. Either. I didn't either. Confidence? I don't know if Bo Cheeks knew he had that in his game. <laughs> I hope he doesn't expect them to have it all the time. Hey, maybe oh, it's, it's something... Maybe. Dude, we just talked about Splitter with the runner, and he missed it. I ripped him, and he just hit a runner. To prove us wrong. I didn't know Splitter had that in his game. Apparently he does. Guys are flexing out there, feeling good about themselves. And David Thomas! From the top of the key, he knocks it down, and we're tied at 60. What a heck of a pace that we're playing the game at now. This has certainly not been the pace we've been accustomed to all game long. It's been tit for tat, but a slow pace now. All engines are running. Their RPMs are at 9,000 right now. Game's picked it up a little bit. It's been fantastic to watch. Oh. And one, Nene, slithering through the defense. Usually, you know, he can just roll right over you. That time he split the deep deftly, and he's heading to the line for an and one. I mean, to continue your point, 36-33 at the half. That's a gross halftime score, but now they are balling. They are on the same page here in the four. And you know what? You could say maybe a little bit it was just a matter of them kind of working their way through the kinks and the stiffness, or maybe just a lot of time practicing and not a lot of time playing games it seems like now both teams are relishing being out on the floor and having to go up against an opposing team a lot like that first preseason game in the NFL where they're tired of banging each other absolutely for a month and they finally get to hit somebody else and it takes a little while to get in the flow and that is an offensive foul Alex English I'm sorry Carl English pounds into Nene who Took the contact, took the foul, and it's going the other way. Now, I wonder, can he really knock a guy like Nene down? Or did Nene see that coming? And just to sell a little bit more, it was definitely a charge. Just not quite sure English is coming with the weight that's needed to knock down a guy like Nene. That was the cherry on top of the Sunday. <laughs> he was already, the Sunday was already delicious. He just had to throw the cherry on top. The movie set, where's the popcorn? That's a great rebound by Dalibear. Gets it up to English. English against Nene, and Nene hacks English this time. And Carl, not Alex, will head to the free throw line. <laughs> and you can see Nene there in pursuit, trying to get his steps down. But we, as we talked about earlier, if you go strong to the basket, referees will reward the effort. That's a good contest right there by Nene and Alex. I'm sorry, I did it again. Carl English took a shot to the face from Nene, and he will feel that. But Carl English is he's a gamer, frankly, and uh, you know obviously he's towed the line, just hit that first free throw, so no worse for the wear. No, absolutely not. And here's a guy, last year he played in Croatia, so he's used to playing in hostile environments. This is a walk in the park for him. He also had a fantastic 2005 FIBA Championship of the Americas where he averaged 18 points and 5.3 rebounds. Happened to lead his team in both of those categories in that 2005 tournament. So we know he's capable of bringing it on this stage. Whether or not he does it tonight and throughout the rest of the tournament remains to be seen. And at the Marchant Cup in San Juan, Puerto Rico, just a, a, a week or a couple of weeks ago, he lit up Carlos Delfino for 30. He's a talented guy, and what I love about him is his ticker. He's got the competitive nature, and he's got a lot of heart. Doesn't mind mixing it up with guys that maybe, in some people's opinions, he, outside or bigger than him, are stronger than him. He doesn't back down from anybody, so I love his tenacity as well. Splitter over the rim right there with the putback. Three-point lead, Mendez, and he's fouled from behind by Tiago Splitter, Juan Mendez. And he really triggered the run. Got Canada back in the game in the second quarter, and he's just kept it going. Juan that's, Mendez has been fantastic. He has been fantastic. And you talk about a guy like Splitter, how effective he's been. That's one way to negate his effectiveness by getting him into foul trouble, by putting him in a situation where he's on his heels, where he has to respond, as opposed to being the aggressor. You see him right now, five fouls coming out of the ball game. That was a heck of a move by the Canadian team to get it into a guy to get him out of the game. Now you don't have to worry about Thiago Splitter doing what he was doing all game long, being very effective because now he's a spectator, just like you and I are. And having fun, by the way. Glad to have you with us watching around the world. We are here in Vegas. It's the FIBA America's Championship 2007. In case you don't know, two births 
in the 2008 Beijing Olympics at stake. The gold and silver winners in this tournament are going to the Olympics. And we have a three-point game. Brazil on top. Barbosa trying to change that, and he draws the foul. Was it a la on Samuel D'Alembert? I believe it was. We're going to have to take another look at this, see what the referees call. No, nope. it may not be on Samuel D'Alembert. I believe it was on Juan Mendez. We're taking a look at him on your screen right there. But look at the change of directions. Look at that. You just simply cannot teach that. It's one thing to have the ability he has to beat people down the floor north and south, but to stop on a dime and go in a completely different direction, that is just a sight to see. It's a beautiful thing. If you're all you basketball fans out there, you're seeing athleticism displayed by Leandro Barbosa at the highest level. Mike D'Antoni had a great quote about him. He said, as fast as he is and as good of a shooter as he is, how can he not be good? <laughs> he should be this good. You know, it's just a beautiful quote by Dan Tony. I mean, he does have the total package, the speed, the shot. He's got the in-between game as well. Barbosa's a stud, no doubt about it. And he's got that stamina as well. You never see him bowing out to a, a challenge. You never see him shying away from any tough situations in the game. He's built to last. And a bailout foul right there by Brazil, 35 feet from the hoop. Marcelinho, the foul on English. And we're just about four minutes to go in this game. And it, there was nothing going on on that possession for Canada. That's just a bad foul by Brazil. And they've become stagnant now. What Brazil's making them do, and you can see them right here, look where their offense is, 30 feet away from the basket. Nothing approaching the lane whatsoever. That is a credit to Brazil, but Canada has to remain on the aggressive end of this exchange right now. They cannot sit back and be forced to conduct their offense. That's just a bad shot. English almost got that one to go. The long three off the mark, and Brazil up five, looking for more. Barbosa short, defended well, and that looked like it was off on D'Alembert, and they call it off on Blue, so Canada gets it back down five, 3.33 to go. They just thought that a Brazilian may have gotten a hand on it over D'Alembert's head. So, on the safe side, we'll give it to Canada. Well, they're not, they're not showing us a replay, so apparently the ref got it right. I've been wrong before. Uh, you and I both. Now, we'll be wrong again. <laughs> Trying to get the ball into D'Alembert here. Not quite sure if that's his comfort zone, 15, 16 feet away from the basket. You'd like to have him post up a little bit closer to that trapezoid lane as opposed to being that far away. That's a jump shooter's range right there. And certainly I'm not quite sure yet that he's proven that he can be effective from 15 feet out. How do you like that? Splitter moments ago picked up number five and had to sit down. Now a huge development. Nene is gone. His fifth foul. Batista in and Canada is down five, and they don't have a great free throw shooter at the line, but you got to like where they're at without splittering the day in the game for Brazil. And what they've done, as opposed to the first half, is they've made a concerted effort to go inside. The first half, they really didn't do that. They let their perimeter players dominate the ball, dominate the shots, but now that they've gone inside, look what it's done for them. It's paid dividends by taking the two best Brazilian bigs out of the game. And D'Alembert cannot cash in at the free throw line so Canada's still down five and now Brazil will go ultra small and give credit to coach Routens for sitting Samuel D'Alembert he's the remaining big guy left on the floor right now and he was the one who was in early foul trouble and he got that rebound up over everybody else English back for Canada working against Machado trying to get down a low to Juan up. Mendez Samuel D'Alembert, did he travel? He did. Good call by the ref. Just couldn't gather that rebound and get the feet set. I'd like to take a look at that again and see if he had possession. As you know, Rick, you can't walk if you don't have possession. I'm thinking it looked to me that he was bobbling it a little bit there, but obviously the referee saw it another way. And we go the other way with Brazil on top by five under three minutes to go in the game. Another good one here from Las Vegas. Boy, it just looks like whenever Barbosa gets it, he'll shoot from anywhere, doesn't he? Looks like he's cocked and ready to go. That one a little bit short, but he got the roll. And a seven-point lead for Brazil. Without their two bigs, uh, still a healthy lead right here. 2.20 to go in the game. One of my former teammates, Sherman Douglas from Syracuse fame, used to call that shot by Barbosa the giant killer. 
Very impressive soft touch there displayed by Barbosa. Oh, that's good defense right there on English. Uh, he split the defense with the spin and drew the foul. But they had him bottled up. That was almost a turnover. And that's exactly what a defense wants you to do, too. When they double you, they want you to turn your back away. What was great there was he stayed facing the basket, stayed aggressive, and left all his options still open to him. That is not an easy shot, folks, right there. Off of one leg in the middle of the lane, in traffic with the soft touch. Another guy who just doesn't look like he's breathing that hard, Rick. And Dalibert at the line got the roll with that one. No, he's, he's, he could play a double header. Let's play two. All those years of probably playing beach soccer teaches you a lot on the beaches of Copacabana and Ipanema down there in Brazil because he is from Sao Paulo. Back to back free throws by Dalibert. He was empty on a trip moments ago. That time, two for two. It's back to a five point game. And Canada needs a stop. We're under two minutes to go. Little geography, Sao Paulo, about an hour and a half away, flight-wise, by plane from Rio de Janeiro, where those beaches are that I mentioned a little earlier. The tap in by Murillo, off the miss. So who needs the nay and splitter? <laughs> the picks continuing to get it done for Brazil. The lead back to seven, buck forty to go for Canada. And the book on Murillo is he's a good outside shooter with a nice touch, but he uses all of that six foot ten frame right there on that offensive rebound. Again, another youngster, twenty four years of age. Got a lot of upside. Overplaying was Mendez. Jermaine Anderson finally hit a shot moments ago, bringing Canada, Canada back within five. Under 10 on the shot clock for Brazil. This is Machada, veteran of the Brazilian national team, and a bad pass. Oh, but it comes right to Murillo when he is fouled by Samuel D'Alembert, and Murillo will go to the line. That's just bad luck there if you're Canada and Coach Leo Routens. I thought you were very aggressive. You're playing really, really good defense, and then at the end to have the defense fall apart by bad luck, let's face it. Just not went, didn't go their way on that exchange if you're Canada. Brazil at the line, up five when we return. Well, this tournament's being played in Las Vegas, but that has not kept the Brazilian faithful from traveling north to check out their team, and they're liking what they're seeing so far. Brazil, thanks to Leandro Barbosa's 29 points, are up five late. Really has kind of taken over the game. Has been assertive all night long. Canada made a little bit of a run there at the beginning of the fourth quarter, but it's really been all about Brazil and their effectiveness on both ends of the floor. And it's a lot easier to get through a game when you've got a guy like that, Leandro Barbosa, leading the way. 29 points, not shooting the best percentage, but still having a very effective game. Murillo tapped it in moments ago. A huge bucket for Brazil and a very big free throw. Gives them a six-point advantage with 1.15 to go. Murillo's another guy. Played very well in the 2007 Pan Am Games. 15 and 7, Whoa. 15 points, 7 boards, almost lost it right there in Canada. That was almost your ball game, exactly. they turned that one over. They need a bucket in the worst way, Allah. They go into Samuel D'Alembert, picked up his fourth foul moments ago, working against Batista, into the corner for English, oh. bobbled it out of bounds, oh no! That was token pressure, that was not overwhelming pressure, a lack of concentration there by English. Now we're under a minute to go. Canada desperate for a stop. And Brazil will just milk that clock. You're in no rush right now. Early shot by Machada, and the rebound comes to Mendez, and he is hacked by Barbosa. A horrible sequence for Brazil. Where do I start? First, you didn't need to <laughs> shoot that quickly. Second of all, you didn't need a three. And third, you certainly do not foul after the rebound has been acquired. So. Three mistakes, the trifecta, if you will. And Brazil right now really has to pick it up and make sure that their concentration level does not fluctuate until that clock says zero. Mendez with a big miss from the Can Canadian perspective. Short on that one, didn't even really give it a chance. His team's still down six. Mendez hits the second five-point game, 43 seconds left. Do you foul here if you're you got to think about fouling right now if you're Canada because you, if you're Brazil, you're going to take every second off of this shot clock possible. Canada right now sitting back 
and allowing Brazil to do whatever it wants. Not quite sure this is the move. I'd love to know what Coach Routens is thinking about right now. Well, you don't foul now. Five on the shot clock. You play it out. Barbosa, pull-up shot off the mark. Oh, and the rebound comes to Morello, making all the little plays here late in the fourth. Now you have to foul. Still not fouling. And they finally got the message from the bench. Routens going nuts over there, telling them to foul. And David Thomas finally gives it away with 13 seconds left, but probably too late. 13 seconds left down five. I question why they didn't foul when they had the first possession, because every second brick, as you know, is very precious. Right now you see the foul there on Barbosa on the reach-in. But when you allow a team to get into a rhythm on the offensive end, and you're running around as a defensive team, helter-skelter, you give up offensive rebounds like Canada just did right there. So not only do you let them waste away a lot of time on their initial possession, but they get a second possession that you're incapable of fouling quickly on as well. So in that exchange, I would imagine Brazil wasted about 25 seconds. And let's face it, those seconds, every one of them, is precious. When you're down like Canada is, no doubt, look at the left side of his lip. Barbosa's got a fat lip, and he's had a fat game, 30 points. And he'll remain at 30. Another loose ball picked up by Murillo, who was just demolished over there in the corner. No foul, and now they give the foul with six seconds left on Valtinho Silva. Brazil, all is going to get out of here with a win. Up six, six seconds left. A well-deserved win uh, when you look at it from their perspective. But if you're Canada, you have to ask yourself, become a little introspective right now and ask yourself, what did we do wrong? What could we have done better? Because six-point game with six seconds left to go, this could have been a totally different outcome if Canada would have taken advantage of those precious possessions at the beginning of periods, at the end of clocks, where they had an opportunity to get easy buckets off of turnovers, but they just simply have not been able to take advantage of the opportunities given to them all night long. You saw Lula Ferreira, the head coach of the Brazilian national team moments ago, sharing a chuckle with the official. And that is the clearest sign of all time <laughs> that this game's in the back. When the coach is relaxed, when the coach is relaxed, all is well. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been really a total team effort. I mean, you, you talk about Barbosa in the 30 points. You know that uh, Splitter made a ton of plays in this game before fouling out. Nene was fantastic before fouling out. Murillo, all the little plays. Uh, Alex Garcia made plays for this team. JP Batista at times was nice. Uh, this Brazilian team uh, looks totally legit, even without Anderson Varejao. I agree with you. They are. They have well-rounded players. They've got guys that have their roles have been defined to them they're very comfortable in those roles and let's face it unlike a lot of other teams right now during the summer this brazilian team has played quite a bit of basketball leading up to this fiba championship of the americas as we look at the venezuelan team there in the tunnel waiting to come out and play against the united states of america but getting back to brazil Brazil has really set the table for themselves very nicely by starting off this game, this first game of the tournament, by getting everybody involved. There's not one person on that team that goes back into the locker room after the game and says, I didn't bring it, I should have done more. Everybody's contributed to this hard-earned win. And coming up after this one, the USA will take on Venezuela. It's on ESPN Classic at roughly 8 p.m. Eastern time, so check out Kobe and Kidd and LeBron and Amari and all the studs going against the Venezuelan national team. One more shot for Canada. Juan Mendez, the miss. Final seconds tick off, and we are through. This is game number three of day one, and it goes to Brazil by the final score of 75 to 67. Leandro Barbosa, a.k.a. Leandrino, leads everybody with 30. A masterful game for him. Lula Ferreira and Barbosa get out of here with a victory, and it's time for the higher play of the game, and it's set up ironically on a pass from Barbosa. All those points, and we show a dime, a kind one at that from Barbosa to Murillo, and that is the higher play of the game. Murillo, like we said, all making all the little plays, completing there off the kind dime from Barbosa. And what I love about Barbosa, penetration with his head up so he can see his options, sees what is available in front of him. The double team collapses. He sees Murillo diving in. What I love about it is when Barbosa had a chance to get himself involved early on in the game. He did so. But along the way, he knew that he was going to have to get help. He got it from guys like Nene. He got it from guys like Tiago Splitter. The list goes on and on. 
There's a superstar that we're looking at on our screen right now who is not afraid of sharing the spotlight, and that bodes well for Brazil in this tournament and in days to come. And at the World Championship last year, we've given you the stat before. If you joined us late, he averaged 13 points per game at the Worlds in Japan last year. 30 points here in the first game of the FIBA Americas Championship. That is the Barbosa that Brazil needs, and he delivered in this game. Well, I would imagine he's on a mission of redemption, if you will. Played fantastic throughout the course of the season in the, in the NBA for the Suns. You think that was enough for him? Well, no, sir. I think that he's got a job to do coming here, and that he sees now that guys like Anderson Varejan are not on the team, not able to play. More opportunity for him to excel, and let's face it, he's never never been a guy to shy away from a challenge. He's a guy who's going to step up and be counted. We've seen it all night long and look for a lot more of the same throughout the rest of this tournament. And how impressed were you by the fact that Splitter fouls out, Nene fouls out within, I don't know, a minute of, of each other? And you would think that that would be a death knell for, for a team. But it actually widened the lead after they left the game. Well, again, it's because, in my opinion, and, and we don't want to blame anybody, but Canada did not go inside anymore. We saw them for a little stretch there really go into Sam, Samuel Dallenbear. They got advantages in the post. When those two guys went out, they stopped going to him in there. And for, for me, I don't know what the reason is, but you would imagine if you went to him with the bigs on the floor, why aren't you going to him when the advantage is clear? and present. Well, he just simply didn't do that. And there's probably a lot of questions Coach Routon is going to ask himself and of his team before they play in the next game. And we just want to send out uh, best wishes and get Absolutely. well soon to Andy Routens, the son of head coach Leo Routens. He suffered a knee injury. It did not look good. Allah said he heard Andy say he heard a pop. And we sincerely hope that the MRI uh, will come up negative. Uh, all the best to the Routens family, obviously, on a bad blow right there. And uh, we are basically done here from Las Vegas, Nevada. It has been the FIBA Americas Championship 2007. For our entire crew and Allah Abdel Nabi, I'm Rick Kamla reminding you, tune it over to ESPN Classic USA against Venezuela. I don't know. I think USA is going to win this game. Going to turn it over there and check it out. Thanks for being with us, everybody.